Delighted to spend some time with you, Stephen, and discuss social initiatives and social innovation. So um, we know you have a really impressive bio and you work at a wonderful uh, organization doing incredible work. But beyond the bio, sometimes there are things that we might not hear about or know about that would offer uh, some extra color to who you are and why you are inspired to do the work that you do and why you're attracted to this space. So would you care to share a little bit of that? Well, sure. I'll pick a couple of uh, things from my past that were pivotal for me or that just seemed to set me on a different course in my life. Um, one of them was in the Amazon and I found myself working on a seismic survey. I'd been a journalist in Latin America covering stories for American and British and Canadian television networks and uh, Stringer for Newsweek and so on and all of that ended very suddenly when the Peruvian government nationalized the press. Mm. And really out of a sense of desperation, I, partner and I took jobs uh, doing seismic surveys in the Amazon at a point when the world was looking for new sources of oil. We'd done the research on the story. We didn't have time to film it before we were nationalized along with the rest of the press. So I found myself uh, making first contact with forest people in the Amazon. And um, it was a moment of tremendous beauty uh, on one hand and of terrible sense of uh, impending doom mm. on the other. Mm. So it was, uh, I remember being on a cliff above a river and in a clearing being approached by people who emerged from the forest and came up to me face to face. We'd been very careful to leave, uh, to signal our arrival before we got there and, um, and in a gentle way say we were coming and so I think that produced a peaceful moment. Mm -hmm. There had been some assassinations and some mm -hmm. attacks in the same area previously and so it was a sense of tremendous danger and vulnerability and of, of great respect at the same time and so you know being face to face with a warrior who you know put his face up that close to me and with children around uh, I just felt how do I take responsibility for this uh, look what's coming behind me if oil should be found here uh, through drilling and so on this all this world is going to be destroyed and I just couldn't I'd never I just changed my path I couldn't no longer be a journalist looking at things, I had to find a way to get more deeply involved in protecting the vulnerable and standing up for what I believed was right as opposed to attempting to be objective and, mm -hmm. and reporting on it. I read Margaret Mead's book, her autobiography, um, Blackberry Winter, mm -hmm. at that time, which she concludes by calling on filmmakers and journalists and so on to document and work with disappearing cultures. So, it set my life on a different course and, and, and deepened my commitment to, uh, to social change and to a world that is sustainable and diverse and protects indigenous values among others. So that was one um, pivotal moment and I'll just recount one other mm. which was uh, a few years later uh, I'd been running a community business in Vancouver uh, that became a really popular place for movement building and music and art and uh, all kinds of events around starting social programs and things. It was just a real hub of, a hive of activity in Vancouver called the Alma Street Cafe. And after seven years, I, it was time to do something else and you know, nobody works harder than a restaurant owner. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun, but it was you know, time to, to move on. And I ended up working for a not-for-profit that was looking for an executive director. They wanted to found something called the Humane Education Society. And I didn't even know what it was, uh, but I looked at it and just thought, well, I would love to do this. This is about um, human-animal relationships. And sort of at the base of this is the biophilia hypothesis of, of E.O. Wilson and the work of Schweitzer and others, this sort of um, tiny, patch of ground in the field of global education called humane education about our relationships with other species. But fundamentally, it's about empathy. Mm -hmm. It's about education of the human heart to recognize our relationships with all other living things. And in the process, uh, I, the very first week on the job, I went to a workshop, a national humane education workshop in Winnipeg, and found myself talking to an American humane educator who told me about her relationship with a mouse and a horse. <laughs> and the fact that both of them were her friends and that she under she had 
you know, allowed them into her understanding and field of relationships and so on. And just opened up for me this whole space for uh, exploration of empathic pathways and a recognition of our deep commitment and obligation to other living, you know, other life forms. Mm -hmm. So for a couple of years, it was my great good fortune to work in the field of humane education and uh, helps me today. Both of those are sort of, I think, part of who I am. And I didn't get to university until I was about 50 years old. Uh, mm -hmm. So I needed to get educated in other ways. And mm -hmm. those are two really important lessons. So glad I asked that question. <laughs> okay, wow. Um, it's actually the one that I looked at and thought, oh, I'm, how am I, I going to answer that? So, <laughs> Thank I had a little sharing. bit of forewarning. That's Thank about you. as far as I got, though. In a similar spirit, um, yeah. some people qu collect quotes and mm -hmm. um, pull on different quotes at various points in time. Is there one that really speaks to you or inspires you that you keep returning to? Well, I have a, a quote that's become a kind of rule that I live by, particularly in this work, in, in foundation work and in... Um, the work of being a servant leader, or, or what I aspire to being, which is an invisible leader who uh, works behind the scenes and enables other people to lead. Uh, and that is that there's no limit to what you can accomplish if you're willing to let others take the credit. Mm. So not having to be the, the guy standing at the front of the parade, uh, you know, it's really that enabling and empowering, I think, that gives the work that we do with the foundation, its best frame and, and most effective way of working. And I admire hugely people like my colleagues, Tim Drayman at SIG, uh, or Al Mansky at Plan in Vancouver. Uh, those are my teachers, among others, who, who work this way and who let others shine and create the space for others to um, step forward and to grow and to be acknowledged for the heroic efforts that they're making. And so. I think that's that's a rule I live by, or try yeah. to hold to that. Um, I guess if there was a quote, um, I actually looked up Margaret. I grabbed Margaret Wheatley on my way in here because her uh, her book Leadership and the New Science has just been another tremendous source of wisdom and, and insight into. Uh, systems and, and systems change and when I just do you have time to read <laughs> <laughs> on my way into interviews like this. Okay. <laughs> um, but I thought there was a nice quote that, that popped out uh, which is uh, it's from Shuang Tzu uh, third century Chinese uh, thinker who said it's more a matter of believing the good than of seeing it as the fruit of our efforts mm. and it's again more about the about being present in the moment and holding to a deep value than of uh, predicating our efforts on some expectation of a future reward or future outcome. And I think that's part of the shift, I think, that we're experiencing as we move from um, A to B linear models of, of interaction with, with systems to uh, something that is uh, more complex on the one hand uh, more heartful on the other, and that situates us, situates us differently with respect to the issues and the relationships that we're involved in. So hmm. that's one I Well, that's a brilliant to segue to my, to my next question. Um, you've just uh, alluded to it. You've been in uh, the social sector, what Henry calls the plural sector, for mm -hmm. a while. Uh, and I would like invite you to comment on sort of some trends and some changes mm -hmm. that you've seen and evolution in this space? Mm -hmm. um, it's a great question, actually, because I think the, um, on the one hand, where we look for innovation is around the edges of systems, and uh, that often means on the borders with other systems. And so whether we're talking about public sector, private sector, or civil society, it's where they bump up against each other or where we find um, some resonant space that enables a conversation to take place. And also in those efforts that are now more and more evident to overcome uh, silos or stovepipe uh, thinking, to look broadly at systems and to organize our work around them uh, in such a way that collaboration uh, is key and easier to say than, than to actually do it, but such an important uh, part of, of the work these days. Um, less a question of uh, a focus on problems and more a question of 
how do we change the, the culture or the context that produces those problems and holds them in place. So we've got a remarkable new set of tools and lenses and understanding around complex systems that is enabling us to do that. I was just enumerating the other day. So we start with social innovation, which is about just looking at the architecture, at the dark matter that holds things in place and, and to sort of unpack that and enable possibility to happen to prototype, to test, to design, um, and so on. So all of that pertaining to social innovation. We've got social entrepreneurship, which provides people with, with sort of entrepreneurial uh, goals and, and passions and capabilities, an opportunity, a set of opportunities to look at society and say, how can you apply this, these disciplines and these tools to creating better organizations, better programs, better mm -hmm. communities? A whole other area that's opening up, social finance uh, it has emerged as an extremely powerful tool for financing better outcomes. Capitalism itself is, is evolving uh, in the times in which we live, has to. Mm -hmm. And so a set of, again, tools, actors, and so on. We then have social labs, these sort of processes now, these containers for enabling people to come together around complex challenges and go deeply into an exploration of what else might be possible, uh, how other outcomes could be uh, explored, and very generative, powerful, creative work uh, being done in that space now around the world. And we just, just a few months ago, held uh, I think the third meeting of uh, global practitioners of these labs. I mm -hmm. came together at Mars in Toronto, certainly the largest ever meeting, and there were about 200 people there, uh, all doing this kind of work from Mind Lab, from Kennisland, from Mars itself. And you know, they added it up and they said, well, all of this work totals about $150 million a year around the entire world. But look what we're moving mm -hmm. in terms of systems and so on using these methodologies. And then fifthly, I would say social tech uh, mm -hmm. is emerging. The ability to use uh, open data sets and open APIs and, and so on is giving us yet another set of capabilities to, uh, to affect large-scale systems change. And you know, we're talking about systems vertically now and not just sort of living up here and, and creating policies and so on. We're talking about what impacts on people on the ground in vulnerable communities. And we have to because we're all vulnerable with climate uh, challenge, with demographic challenges, health challenges. There's just so much that we need to get organized differently how fortuitous that we have the tools with which mm. to grapple with some of these things. So mm. it's a pretty exciting moment. So you see a lot of opportunities. You've just described some of them that are mm. sort of ramping up. Yeah. Do you see any challenges in the space? God. <laughs> no. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, clearly, there are many challenges, both in terms of the, the scale and complexity of the problems we're trying to, to contend with. Uh, you don't have to do, I, mean, I don't have to tell you, I don't have to enumerate them, but you know, clearly they are uh, serious and long-term and entrenched and, and, and furthermore, uh, still coming at us. There are challenges that we haven't imagined yet. A year ago, nobody was talking about uh, ISIS. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't know about mm -hmm. the Ebola mm -hmm. um, you know, crisis that is currently uh, emerging. Uh, we've got so much more coming at us because the, the turbulence, the nature of the turbulence that we're in now is such that it won't, uh, it's not amenable to uh, direct efforts to address it. We have to go to underlying conditions and just getting there and being able to hold the, the calm space, in a sense almost the spiritual uh, space around uh, our relationships to each other, to ourselves, to the planet, uh, that's not easy to do. It takes patient, considerate, and, and thoughtful work, purposeful uh, commitment. So we've got all of that as one you know, sort of set of difficulties, the scale and nature of the problems, our own ability to, to stand appropriately with respect to them, and then a set of cultural and institutional constraints that we bring forward from the past that inhibit our ability to uh, fluidly move in, in sort of and to adapt. So that's, that's, that's quite a bit in terms of challenge. Yeah. Um, but you know, so the, it, in a sense, it's a race. And we've got uh, a, a lot to do in a relatively short time. 
And so it is critically important that we, we make the commitments and explore the space and do the very best we can. So cue the MOOC, right? The yeah. group. Cue the MOOC. <laughs> right. right. Our, our goal really is to yeah. bring together people that are already working on social initiatives mm -hmm. or people from around the world who share similar uh, values and want to work together on change mm -hmm. in society. So we've identified a number of themes um, that we think are important as people are developing social initiatives. Mm -hmm. And we, we frame social initiatives quite broadly within the space of social innovation. It could be a social enterprise as much as it could be part of a social movement. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've identified as important is sort of designing and visioning and imagining where you want to get and how are you going to get there. But the successful stories that we hear about social initiatives that scale and, and, and become globally renowned, uh, it, it, it appears that it's a linear process when, in fact, uh, it is far from that. And we do not hear a lot about sort of the, the many different fortuitous routes people have taken. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have any of your own personal experiences um, that you can draw from or from um, supporting grantees at the foundation mm -hmm. where learning, pivoting, iterating has been um, um, a valuable part of the process. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's a, a couple of ways to answer that question. Um, one is that uh, learning to adapt and uh, track uh, what you're doing as you're doing it in a way that allows you to consciously adapt your strategy requires us to move from traditional strategic planning, so-called, to a more relational and um, iterative way of working. And so in that context, we've been part of uh, developing something called developmental evaluation that we've, you know, as a formal discipline, uh, it's being practiced around the world. We, we've used it and, and learned a lot from doing it. And basically just builds in short feed feedback loops into processes where we have a general sense of what we're trying to achieve, but really no sure pathway from here to there. So the, the efforts that we undertake to uh, work on poverty or on other complex issues are, are considerably enhanced by uh, building into the culture of the initiative the ability to step back, reflect, uh, note the path taken and the path not taken, uh, so as to be able to come back to the alternative if, if, if the one you've taken doesn't work, for example, but also to pick up the, uh, the signals around in the, in the context in which you're working and incorporate those, because often you know, the system that you're working with is speaking back to you. Mm -hmm. And if you go in with two uh, much of a formed intent or, or you know, concrete idea of what you're going to achieve, you ignore those signals to your peril and, and to the detriment of the overall initiative. So all, all that to say there's a, uh, a kind of humbleness to this kind of work that says we're going to try this but we're not really sure mm -hmm. and we're going to watch and see what happens when uh, the unexpected happens because that's when we can learn the most. Um, it's also, I think, partly about how we about learning how to work in teams and in fluid teams. And so, um, the relationships that we have on projects and in organ in institutions are fundamental to our capacity to actually do things well together. And so, there's a lot of work here at this foundation. We went through a period when we didn't dismantle our hierarchical structures entirely, but we, we watered them down considerably. We became a flatter organization where finance talks to management, talks to admin, talks to people inside and outside the foundation in a much more fluid way as, so as to allow ideas to move forward, to be surfaced from unexpected quarters. And so that cultural, organizational cultural piece, I think, is another important dimension of this work. Um, and I think you know we have specific examples where that has we've just gone aha, um, look at that, look what we didn't know that we didn't know when we started down this road. And so, uh, give you an example with Youthscape, for example, which was an effort to reach uh, youth to help organizations like United Ways and YMCA's and others to reach youth that they were not reaching, street-involved youth, Aboriginal youth, immigrant youth, just beyond the reach of current programs. We set up eight 
demonstration sites across the country and funded each of them to get past their current boundaries to look at where they were not looking. And we built in a developmental evaluation capacity in that program among the youth at the edges of the program and had them report back to uh, a, a coordinator, of, an evaluation coordinator. And we gave those people, we translate, transposed our ability to make grants out to the front end of that initiative. So it was the people on the ground, the young people themselves at the edges of their organizations who were empowered to make grants to people who'd never been connected. Like here's $150 to get started on the plan for that skateboard park or here's funding that you need to convene that group of young people and interview them and talk to them about what they need and so on. And it took a while before the organizations could actually do that. They said, well, you know, you can't just hand over money for people to do things. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to make those decisions. So the answer was, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Try it. See what happens. And the developmental evaluation feedback that we got from those frontline staff provided just an in ongoing series of insights and changed the culture of those programs and organizations considerably. Mm. So moving the, the dynamics, the resources, the power structures, uh, the assumptions uh, to enable different things to happen is, is critical to this work. Mm. Now you touched on um, a little bit of the the team, co not so much cohesion, but the, the, the processes and the dynamics of a team mm -hmm. working um, together on, on, on a particular project. The second um, topic that we are addressing after designing is mobilizing. So I wonder if you could comment on what you've seen as not necessarily best practices, but what facilitate um, really good mobilizing within an organization, and then also sort of the types of um, processes and skills that are required to, to mobilize stakeholders from outside the organization. Hmm. And part of me wants to challenge you on the question mm -hmm. and to say that talking about projects is, is perhaps not the most um, operative or effective way to, to think about this because we tend to design projects and end up managing portfolios of projects and lose sight of the larger systems that we're actually part of or that are part of what we're trying to get at and that we don't get at effectively with projects. Mm -hmm. So part of this, I think, part of the work going forward is to, to look at systems and uh, think about you know, mapping them or understanding what they are and where you stand in relationship to that system and what is it about that system that holds things in place. Mm -hmm. And with a strategic map, or a map that allows you to look at where you want to intervene, you can identify unexpected, uh, unexpectedly powerful opportunities to move a system or to design a project, an intervention, or a provocation that might produce uh, results well beyond what you would achieve through a project, per se. I guess what we see now as a, as a viable way of getting at uh, the mobilization question is uh, what we're using now a lot uh, or you know, begun using and I think is quite powerful is platform strategies. And so the notion with a, a platform is that you allow people to take what they need and go as deep as they want to around an issue as opposed to uh, providing it to them in, in predetermined bite-sized pieces that you expect them to consume and we're talking now about programs. Um, and, and so with Inaweave, for example, uh, there's a, and a, this goes to the MOOC question, it's like how much do you want? Well, take as much as you want and, and, and or need and, and then move on. But you know, we're shifting the, the offer now from we know what's good for you to let us curate knowledge with you and, uh, and so within a we, we actually provide a series of, of deeper levels of engagement from come to the website, look at some materials, uh, download them if you wish, but get a sense of what this is. We've got material orga organized by module. If you're really interested, come to a one day workshop, but only if you're really serious and we don't want to put our workshops uh, at the we want to open it to everybody. They're really designed for people who are intend to go further. So come with a team, come with a learning partner, 
and uh, there's a there's a one day in person workshop which we can provide you. If you want to go further, if you actually want to implement one of these tools around social innovation, social finance, social entrepreneurship, then you know we'll help you get a grant that will enable you to hire a coach or a teacher who will accompany you on that uh, journey through implementation and learning about something. And the interesting thing is that what we're seeing now is uh, communities of practice are forming around the people providing that coaching and teaching. So they've got interesting cases they share with each other and, uh, and you know, we're seeing a, the emergence of a whole new ecosystem around a set of ideas that was you know, at the core is really about how do we get very high quality management support at very low cost into the hands of people making change. So in that sense, it's a systems uh, approach. It's layered, it's uh, scaled, it, it's presented at scale, and it enables user-determined uh, levels of, of commitment and, and feedback and so on. So. Mm. Very interesting. That, and so I think what, what we're looking at there in terms of mobilization is uh, using people's inherent uh, desires to mobilize at the level that they wish to mm -hmm. and providing them with opportunities to go further should they wish to, but not assuming it and, and actually requiring that people show some level of commitment and understanding before we let them into mm -hmm. uh, the, next, the next level. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's very motivating for people when they can make the choice and when there's a little bit of a bar there, it's not just like, here, take it all, it's free. Mm -hmm. uh, that isn't the equation either. There's got to be some kind of uh, clarity of purpose around this for people as they move through a system like that. And uh, it's not, I think, um, completely uh, irrelevant that one of the key modules on this platform is around theory of change. So understanding your own theory of change is a great way to motivate yourself and your organization. So what do we think we're doing here? Mm -hmm. uh, how do we think we're going to get there? Mm -hmm. uh, having that shared across an organization has actually been proven to be a surprisingly powerful process for helping organizations to focus on what they're trying to do, uncovers uh, unexamined assumptions and uh, interesting tensions. So I think there's a, it's a very interesting space to explore as part of any effort at systemic change. I'll use um, this opportunity since we're talking about people who want to create change. If you have anything to say about leadership versus community ship, um, there's a, a lot of talk in the social entrepreneurship literature about sort of hero worship, that the social mm. entrepreneur who you know, manages to scale an effort becomes sort of the only person who can represent the organization when it's a, in fact a team effort. I wonder if right. you could comment. Right. Well, I mean that's certainly um, I think a, a characteristic of, of this movement. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to go to Skoll a couple of years ago and you know there was a, a steady buzz around the room around a critical buzz around you know what are we doing sitting here in, an, in a theater uh, applauding the, the charismatic megafauna of the social entrepreneurship world and you, know, you do admire these people. They have done a lot. They are um, spreading, you know, important and powerful messages. But we do recognize, I think, that uh, systems change requires uh, humble and persistent and patient collaboration and followership, uh, as much as it requires that uh, that that kind of visible leadership that we're talking about. So. They're complementary, obviously, and, and an ability to work across that divide and to understand the dynamics of that whole process is important. And we certainly see examples um, of the the founder syndrome, of the, the charismatic leader uh, becoming uh, obsolete or standing in the way of necessary evolutionary, you know, a necessary evolution of their initiative because we're all you know, ideally looking for people smarter than ourselves or more capable than ourselves to uh, carry the work forward. And, and that means investment in other people's abilities as much as it means sort of being visibly uh, at the head of the parade. Mm -hmm. so. so I'll move on to the fourth uh, topic, mm -hmm. um, which is financing. So we know that there are a variety of sources of funding uh, within the social sector that the social sector can tap. 
Um, you have taken a lead role, as in the, the foundation has taken a lead role in the social finance impact investing space. Um, what did you see as writing on the wall and what appealed to you and do you have any early success stories uh, coming out of that? Yeah, well, um, I think we were fortunate to be part of the uh, social finance task force that um, was organized at, through Mars and SIG and that published its report in 2010. Uh, calling on governments, foundations, uh, others in the investment field to mobilize more capital for the public good. And we took that to heart and have created uh, a program here where we are attempting to combine our endowment resources, capital resources, with our granting program to create um, more opportunity for systemic change. And I have to say we're very excited about some of the things that we've accomplished, um, really with, in, in some senses, very little capital, really, for example, a loan guarantee that uh, we put in place that was the, the trigger, in a sense, for building a $25 million LEED Platinum office building here in Montreal, uh, co-owned by a consortium of environmental and community organizations. And, just by reducing the interest rate on a critical loan with our guarantee, uh, we enabled the project to go ahead. Now, it took a year and a half for us to make that decision because we had to review the entire project from five different perspectives, from the contractors involved to the net commercial value of the building to the environmental uh, target that it was intended to reach. Was it going to get there to the capital campaign that was going to be uh, put in place to pay back lenders and so on. So all of that was a lot of work uh, and, and represented huge investment of human capital versus a relatively small investment, just a loan guarantee. We didn't actually spend any money to uh, enable the project to go ahead. And a lot of impact investing is like that, that it requires careful due diligence and uh, the selection of partners around new projects. But I think that you know, undeniably, the ability to leverage grant funds, which create the conditions for further investment with program-related investments, which the government allows us to claim as grants should they not pay back their, their you know, the investment. Uh, and on top of that, to put, you know, real capital or investment capital to work creates a capital stacking effect that enables us to get to much larger levels of scale in terms of investment in issues like Aboriginal housing, which happens to be an area that we're involved in now. Um, we are expecting that our initial uh, few grants of, of $25,000, $50,000 to create the conditions for a program-related investment of half a million roughly, which is leveraging other investments, bringing us to a $2 million fund to build some demonstration projects around a core idea that we think is transformational, is eventually going to get us to the hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of many, many, many houses built uh, in what is otherwise a very difficult area to uh, look at owned housing models on Aboriginal reserves. So we just didn't have that capacity when we were only granting. And around systemic change, we are trying to change resource flows. Uh, and we've been given this tremendous tool with, with, with which to do that. So in healthcare, in uh, social technology, whole range of issues, poverty and social entrepreneurship, we've got uh, a brand new and very exciting set of tools and some leadership opportunities with others to, to move that field forward. So what would you say to the critics um, of, you know, oh, this is faddish, or if uh, the banks are getting involved in major institutional uh, players, that there must be something suspicious about it, or people who don't really understand, like, what would you say to the critics of impact investing in terms of what the potential is? Well, we all need good critics. And so, you know, I think the, the, the criticisms of this are that it is just sort of window dressing. And, and in fact, you know, everybody's calling what they do impact investing, or people may be rushing into it without really knowing what they're getting into. And, and we're bound to see some uh, spectacular failures. Uh, fortunately, we're able to learn from what's happening in the UK and the US primarily around. Uh, the, the need to manage supply and demand, to uh, be careful, for example, around the SIB, the social impact bond uh, thing, which for a while was the sort of poster child for social finance. Um, 
Those are eminently corruptible as people choose to report on outcomes that generate financial returns. So there are some risks involved, but investing always involves risks. And uh, again, with program-related investments, we've been given an opportunity by current tax regulations that de-risk some of that uh, kind of investment for us. So we can, as I was saying, claim a loss on a program-related investment as a grant and use that to meet our granting quota. Yep. So there's a, a de-risking there, but I think broadly we're, you know, what, what mission-based or, or impact investing is doing is de-risking investments for larger commercial investors. So we're playing a role in the overall economy of uh, taking some early risks uh, and showing that there are viable models. We expect to fail in some cases. Uh, if we're not, then we're not trying hard enough. But uh, where we succeed, we should be able to leverage much larger amounts of capital to flow to what are otherwise uh, challenges that we're chronically paying for, uh, you know, you know non-systemic interventions, or just treating symptoms uh, with tax dollars that are scarce, more and more scarce. So impact investing ought to be moving upstream, demonstrating uh, beneficial social impact and enabling governments, taxpayers, to pay less for uh, better outcomes and providing opportunities for social entrepreneurs to step in and creatively reshape some of these systems to the greater public good. You've sold me. Um. I have a place <laughs> for you to sign on your way out, and take your check. Yep. So we're on to our last um, topic, which is assessing. How do you measure social impact? It's a really complex um, process and um, a lot of people um, who are doing really great work are finding themselves bogged down by the reporting, uh, having to pay outside consultants to do the work for them, mm -hmm. a lot of mission drift, a lot of risk to be innovative because in order to get the next grant you have to be successful last time around. So what do you what would you have to say about the, um, the importance of measuring social impact relative to the challenges um, in yeah. the space? This is a great question. I think um, we're struggling to <coughs> measure, uh, reliably measure and report on social impact. So uh, measurement tools are, are imprecise. Uh, we're often, traditionally at least in this field, uh, coming too late to look at outcomes and uh, missing the story of how we got there or uh, not even accounting for them at all. I mean, just so much funding goes into social programs to perpetuate the status quo on the broad assumption that we're doing good. But, you know, when things don't change after a generation or two, I was just in Vancouver visiting the food bank and the director was saying that, you know, they're looking now at the third generation of people coming to use the food bank. They've grown from 200 users a week to 28,000, and they have never yet asked, why are you here, to the people coming to use the food bank. They've just started to sort of understand what's going on, what's the story, uh, how do we come at this differently. So, in a sense, we need to bring that kind of uh, monitoring and evaluation and uh, narrative building into our social systems to ask the question, why are you here? Why does this keep happening? What are you trying to achieve? How can we help you do things differently? And that's an, in a sense a cultural shift for the philanthropic and community sector, but it also brings us back to the beginning of you know, what this MOOC is about, which is how do we create better systems? And that means that we work, have to work with government, private sector, and civil society to uh, create uh, the capacity for systemic change that draws on the capacity for policy making, for uh, grassroots interventions, testing, prototyping, and so on, as well as the application of business models and business thinking to uh, create better systems. So that in that sense, you know, we're both learning how to evaluate Quanti you know, with, with quantifiable uh, data. Uh, we're learning how to use data and to incorporate measurement into systems. We're certainly looking at things like smarter cities and, and you know, the, the use of data monitoring across uh, large landscapes. We can be doing that in social systems too. We've got data sets. 
open data is becoming a reality and, and I think we're going to see more articulation of real-time monitoring uh, around social outcomes. But with that though goes this narrative building question. That's another difficult part, the, 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 the qualitative measures that we use to tell the story of what's happening, to share that more broadly so that people see possibility, invitation, hope uh, around some of our stuck problems. So there's a dual side, dual aspect of this and, and a really important one that we have not solved yet. It's still, still coming together, but I think we've got lots of work to do there. So you've been incredibly generous. I have one final question if you'll indulge. And it has to do with a story that you've shared with me that's really stayed with me since you've told it. <laughs> and it's very connected to the story or to the, to the topic of, of assessing. Um, you told the story of um, a school, an Aboriginal school in the north, mm -hmm. and there was an assessing question that could have potentially cut off the funding. Could you share that story? Yeah, so basically this is a story about why it's um, important not to bring old measures into new spaces. And this was a case uh, where a school in northern Alberta that had chronically uh, produce the, the worst uh, scores on standardized testing in that province, had, had done so for at least a decade, uh, was introduced to a new way of working where artists were working with teachers to uh, deliver the curriculum using an art form. And uh, it was a radical idea that was, was being tested because nothing else had worked over, over a number of years. And, um, Interestingly, after the very first year, some metrics started to change. For example, it was the first year in memory that all of the teachers didn't quit at the end of the year, which is the normal pattern. In fact, they all stayed. And that one measure alone was interesting because when you looked at the test results and the fact that they actually went down in that first year, you might have said, well, this isn't working, stop, and let's go back to at least where we were. But the fact that all the teachers stayed indicated that there was a, a new dynamic, a new set of relationships emerging here. The second year, they adapted the program, they spent more time you know, designing the year, cal recalibrating certain aspects of the program and so on. And wouldn't you know it, after the second year, the results went down again test scores worsened for the second year in a row and they were already the worst in the province. So again you would say, well that's enough of that, you know, what are we doing here? But the fact that attendance was going up, that school kids who had dropped out of school were coming back or kids that came one day a week were showing up four or five and that parents were coming to the school and volunteering for the first time or that the bus driver uh, was said it, it only took her an hour and a half to pick up all the kids every morning instead of two hours and a half, meant that something was changing, something important. And you know, when I went to the school and, and saw this firsthand, I realized you know, there's, there's hope here. And I happened to speak to um, an inspector from the federal government, the federal interlocutor for uh, Métis and uh, non-status Indian affairs, passed through the school and his comment was, I've never seen this before. The kids are walking tall in the hall. There was a sense of pride and of engagement and excitement about what was happening there that didn't, wasn't reflected in the marks. Now, after the third year, marks went lower again, but just a little bit, and all these other indicators were, were improving. And there were some kids who were now moving from grade two to grade seven in reading in one year. There was like a, this sort of escalator up here that wasn't there before. Like, if you want to be here, we're here. We can get you from grade two to grade seven. Kids were like coming out. Attendance was way up. Parental involvement, et cetera, et cetera. In the fourth year, after the project ended, that was the most improved school in, in the entire uh, province. So just the remarks shot up. But you know that lag time, I think, is the important piece, that when you're changing systems, you have to be patient, first of all. There's a level of noise and confusion and a need to leave space for a new metric to take hold uh, other than the, the narrow one you started with. So. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so much, as always. Thank you, Anita. <laughs> and like, oh, I just think how good I would have been if I'd prepared <laughs> all of that. <laughs>